morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, a new warning this morning. The Kremlin with a chilling threat. After the U.S. urges NATO allies to ramp up military support for Ukraine, a top Russian diplomat once again hinting at the possibility of World War III, saying the threat of nuclear war, quote, should not be underestimated. The high-stakes meeting between a top U.N. official and Vladimir Putin today as wartime rhetoric approaches a breaking point. Also this morning, Trump in contempt. The former president now fined thousands of dollars a day until he turns over vital documents subpoenaed by New York State's attorney general. It's all part of that ongoing civil investigation into the Trump organization, how his legal team is responding. Plus, renewed focus this morning on January 6th and the former president's time in the White House. What's happening? A landmark moment in the world of social media. Billionaire Elon Musk now set to buy Twitter for $44 billion. We'll dig into the fine print and the changes it could bring to your fee. And the final frontier. It's one small step for man and one giant leap for womankind. We'll introduce you to the first black woman to have a long duration stay hundreds of miles above planet Earth at the International Space Station. And a hint, she's a bit of a rock star. <laughs> we'll get into that in a little bit. I know what you mean. <laughs> there we go, all right. All right, this morning we are watching two key meetings on the war in Ukraine. Defense ministers are gathering in Germany to discuss ways to supply more weapons to the country. And the UN Secretary General is in Moscow to meet with President Putin. Yeah, this all comes after Russia's foreign minister accused NATO of engaging in a proxy war with Russia and fueling the risk of World War III. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin has the latest from northern Ukraine. Hey there, this was the scene of a ferocious battle. Just take a look at that wreckage. This morning, the U.S. Secretary of Defense is in Germany meeting with the allies from more than 40 countries to discuss ways to help Ukraine win more battles like the one that took place here. Meanwhile, Russian Foreign Minister is issuing an ominous warning. This morning, as the war enters its third month, the U.S. Defense Secretary meeting allies in Germany to discuss Ukraine's military needs. Nations of goodwill from around the world stand united in our resolve to support Ukraine in its fight against Russia's imperial aggression. Overnight, the Russian foreign minister is suggesting Western arms shipments to Kyiv are a sign NATO is in essence engaged in a proxy war with Russia. Sergei Lavrov warning the risk of the conflict escalating to nuclear war is real. This morning, the Ukrainian foreign minister hitting back, accusing Lavrov of trying to scare the world off supporting Ukraine. That support on full display when the U.S. secretaries of state and defense visited Kyiv on Sunday. We want to see Russia uh, uh, weakened uh, to the degree that it can't uh, do the kinds of things that uh, it has done uh, in, in invading Ukraine. Andrei Yermak is head of the Ukrainian president's office. It's important for you to hear that from your U.S. ally. That statement. Yes, yes, it's a very important. During this war, Ukrainians exactly understand who is the friends and who is not. And of course, United States, it's our friend. Hours after the U.S. Secretary's secret visit to Ukraine, the Russian military bombarding train stations and crucial infrastructure far from the front line. And in the northern city of Cherniv, they're dealing with the aftermath of the Russian occupation, weeks after Ukrainian forces drove them out of the city. This was the scene of a major battle. Now they're cleaning it up, carefully removing the shells and the mines the Russians left behind. For many here, the deadly weapons, a show of just how far Russia is willing to go to destroy their country. The U.N. Secretary General is in Moscow this morning to meet with the Russian foreign minister. The Secretary General says he's there to call for a truce, but he's also been coming under fire here in Ukraine for not visiting Kyiv first. All right, Aaron McLaughlin, thank you so much. Let's get more on Ukraine with Angela Stent. She's a senior advisor to the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies at Georgetown University and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Angela, thanks for joining us. So I want to start with the latest on this diplomatic effort by the U.N. Secretary General in Moscow for talks with President Putin. Do you see any path at all right now for a diplomatic resolution? If so, what, what might that look like? 
Well, so the Secretary General would like to get an agreement for a, at least a ceasefire, a truce, so that um, uh, there can be humanitarian corridors out of some of these cities. So far, the Russians do not seem interested in any kind of diplomatic resolution to this. Um, so far, they have not honored any of the ceasefires that they've agreed to, and they've, you know, fired on people escaping in these humanitarian corridors. So. I'm skeptical about this. Maybe the Secretary General can get uh, Putin to agree to that, but I don't. I wouldn't hold my breath. We know Ukraine continues to call for more weapons. The West is providing a steady flow of arms in the country. But as we heard from Russia's foreign minister yesterday, he's accusing NATO of fighting a proxy war with Russia, raising the risk of a nuclear conflict. Are you concerned that NATO is risking a direct confrontation with Russia, Russia especially if those NATO-supplied weapons are used to target any supply lines actually in Russia? Well, so the irony is that the Russians have, from the beginning, believed that they were fighting a proxy war with NATO. I mean, Putin and others have hinted at that. Uh, so now they're accusing NATO of doing what they, in fact, are doing. Of course, we have to be concerned about escalation. Of course, we have to be concerned because Putin is at various times threatened vaguely and not it's so vaguely that he could use nuclear weapons. Uh, and, but I think that the NATO countries in the U.S. are being very careful in what they're doing and how they're supporting applying these weapons and, and what uh, the Ukrainians are doing in terms of using them, they're being very careful to try and not escalate this. But we can't rule it out completely because, of course, accidents can happen, particularly during a war. Here's something that's getting more attention in the last week, and that's the situation with Ukraine's neighbor Moldova. There have been reports today of explosions in the country's eastern breakaway region. A Russian military official said last week that Moscow wants to control the southern part of Ukraine and create a corridor to that part of Moldova. What do you make of what's happening there and how concerned should we be about it? I think we should be very concerned about it. There is this breakaway region of Moldova where there are Russian soldiers and which is very pro-Russian. And that has been one of the Russian goals from the beginning to create this corridor and take that piece of territory, maybe reunited again with Russia. Um, so, on the other hand, if you look at the way that the Russian military is performing at the moment, it's very hard to see how they could get as far as Transnistria, which is this breakaway region. They're having trouble even taking the rest of the Donbass. So, I would be skeptical about that, but I think we have to accept that that could be one of their longer-term goals. Yeah, I mean, I guess that is, you kind of touch on the big question there. It seems like they're already having enough trouble with Ukraine that why would they then try and set their sights on something else beyond Ukraine, right? Right. I think they just want to warn everyone that no one is safe. Everyone um, should be concerned about what Russia may do next. It's part of their playbook to keep everyone off guard and guessing. Um, but I think the Moldovans do have to take this seriously. They have a large number of Ukrainian refugees, and they are vulnerable, and they always have been. And their armed forces are, are not nearly as strong and effective as those of Ukraine. All right. Angela, thanks so much for your analysis this morning. We appreciate it. Now let's get to some big news here at home. A New York state judge is holding former President Donald Trump in civil contempt, ordering him to pay $10,000 a day until he turns over documents subpoenaed by the state's attorney general. It's all part of an ongoing investigation into the business practices of the Trump organization. NBC News senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson has the latest. It's a setback for former President Trump and a warning from the judge to basically stop stonewalling. And it's a decision his attorneys plan to fight. For former President Trump, a costly complication. A New York judge is holding the former president in civil contempt, ordering him to pay $10,000 a day until he turns over documents subpoenaed by the state's attorney general. The judge delivering this message to the former president, who was not in court, Mr. Trump, I know you take your business seriously, and I take mine seriously. Attorney General Letitia James calling the ruling a major victory. His She's conducting a civil investigation benefit. of possible tax fraud at the Trump Organization and whether the company inflated the value of its assets for tax breaks and loans. The Trump Organization says it's turned over more than 750,000 documents and has denied any wrongdoing. But James's office argues the company has been slow to produce documents central to the investigation. In court documents pointing to cabinets holding Mr. Trump's files and post-it notes that he used to communicate with his employees. 
The former president's attorney in a statement saying they intend to appeal the court's decision, adding they produced all the documents covered by the subpoena months ago. What the judge wants to know, Hallie, is whether or not the other side, the Trump folks, really tried to comply with the subpoena or just kind of rubber stamped it, said we've looked and we can't find anything more. There's also new focus this morning on Mr. Trump's time in office. As a trove of new text messages sent and received by the former president's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, spotlights the Trump team's efforts to overturn the election and their reactions to January 6th. NBC News has not independently verified the more than 2,300 messages first reported by CNN. As the attack on the Capitol unfolded, Meadows reportedly got a barrage of texts from allies, including his predecessor, Mick Mulvaney, writing President Trump needs to stop this now. From Mr. Trump's son, Donald Trump Jr., they will try to expletive his entire legacy on this if it gets worse. Even Marjorie Taylor Greene, who supported lies about the 2020 election results, wrote in a text to Meadows, please tell the president to calm people. This isn't the way to solve anything. NBC News has reached out to Meadows' attorney and others cited in those texts. Mick Mulvaney has confirmed the accuracy of his messages, but no comment yet from the others. Back to you. All right, Hallie Jackson, thank you so much. This morning, the World Health Organization is investigating a new outbreak of severe hepatitis in young kids, and that's putting health experts around the world on edge. At least one child has died, another 17 need liver transplants. The virus has quickly spread to 12 countries, including here in the U.S. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Goss joins us now for more on this alarming breakout. Steph, good morning. Good morning, Joe. You know, COVID restrictions have dropped in Europe and the U.S., but other viruses have surged. And now doctors and researchers believe one of those viruses, adenovirus, may be behind these dozens of cases of liver failure among children. This morning, health officials are sounding the alarm about a mysterious new outbreak of severe hepatitis in young kids. According to the World Health Organization, nearly 170 cases of acute liver disease have now been identified in children as young as one month old up to 16 years old. The majority of cases found in the U.K., with at least 14 reported here in the U.S., in Alabama, North Carolina, and Illinois. Worldwide, so far, one child has died and 17 have needed liver transplants. This seems to be happening in the majority of otherwise healthy children who had no other medical issues. The CDC also issued an urgent health advisory last week after a cluster of nine cases was identified in Alabama. Completely healthy kids coming in with severe liver injury, um, definitely not normal. While hepatitis or inflammation of the liver is often caused by viral infections like hepatitis A, B and C, officials say they're exploring a possible new link between hepatitis and adenovirus, commonly linked with colds. The nine patients that we have here so far, they all tested positive for adenovirus. Adenovirus typically do not cause hepatitis. What it causes is that respiratory illnesses or gastrointestinal illness. Worldwide, adenovirus was detected in more than 40 percent of the total cases reported in kids. Many of the patients experienced gastrointestinal symptoms like abdominal pain, diarrhea and vomiting, as well as jaundice. Though health officials are still investigating the cause behind the recent outbreak, doctors warn adenovirus can spread through personal contact, which means washing hands is now even more crucial. The number of cases here are extremely low. This is still extremely rare. But just keep an eye on your child. If you have any issues or any questions, simply talk to your doctor. Health officials say neither COVID nor the COVID vaccines seem to have anything to do with the hepatitis cases. The vast majority of children with this form of hepatitis have not been vaccinated. Guys, back to you. Stephanie Gosk. Steph, thank you. Now, the richest man in the world, Elon Musk, is spending $44 billion to take over Twitter. But what will the surprising buyout mean for users of the social media platform? NBC News business and tech correspondent Jolene Kent joins us from Los Angeles with a closer look. Hey, Joe, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. You know, Twitter is yet another feather in Elon Musk's cap, as long as it's approved by regulators. Elon Musk, of course, already running SpaceX and Tesla. The big questions this morning is what will it mean for Twitter and what will change in your Twitter feed? Elon Musk is taking over Twitter to the tune of $44 billion. After weeks of corporate wrangling, Twitter's board of directors accepting the billionaire's buyout offer in a unanimous vote. 
Musk, who has been one of Twitter's biggest critics, celebrating with rocket emojis, tweeting in part, free speech is the bedrock of a functioning democracy and Twitter is the digital town square. If approved by regulators, Twitter will go private and shareholders will earn over $54 in cash for each share of common stock. So what is Musk going to change in your Twitter feed? He says he plans to add new features, making the algorithms open source to increase trust, defeating the spam bots, and authenticating all humans. Well, I think it's very important for uh, there to be an inclusive arena for free speech. Other ideas on the table, charging users a small subscription fee and adding an edit button for tweets. Some critics worry how Musk, who's faced his own backlash over controversial and offensive tweets, will handle Twitter's challenges with misinformation and toxic content. The ACLU raising concerns over a powerful central actor having so much control over the boundaries of our political speech online. Rival billionaire and Amazon founder Jeff Bezos also throwing shade at the deal, questioning whether China would gain more influence over Twitter due to Musk's other company, Tesla, doing so much business there. The Chinese government has banned Twitter since 2009. Musk burst onto the tech scene when he founded the company that would become PayPal, later selling it to eBay for one and a half billion dollars. He used those profits to start SpaceX and later Tesla. He's still the CEO of both companies. Musk ultimately could be taken on more than he believes, but it's Musk and we all know he's going to go to the beat of a different drum. Now, Elon Musk also receiving the endorsement of the former CEO of Twitter, Jack Dorsey. He's also a co-founder, and he was tweeting overnight that he believes that Elon is the singular solution I trust. Jack also saying, I trust his mission to extend the light of consciousness. Now, there's a lot of controversy as to what will happen next, but remember, this is not a done deal yet. They've come to an agreement, but all of this is subject to shareholder and regulatory approval that is expected to take months. And as we know with Elon Musk, months, weeks means anything can happen. Savannah. That's certainly true. That's been the case over the last few weeks with this back and forth. All right, Jolene, yes. Ken, thank you so much. Time to get a check on your morning news now, weather. Which means Michelle Grossman is back this hour. Hey, Michelle. Hey there, guys, and we are watching a cold front that's bringing the chance for April showers, even some strong thunderstorms later on this afternoon and evening. It's the same cold front that brought some storms to central Ohio yesterday. We saw an EF0 tornado move through. It brought up, ripped off some roofs, it damaged some cars. There was that video right there. And we saw winds gusting to 80 miles per hour. We do have the chance, a low chance for tornadoes, but it's certainly in the cards today. Also the chance for some strong winds, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour, and even the chance of some hail. It should be on the small side, too. So this is what it looks like right now, a long frontal system stretching from New England all the way to the Gulf Coast states, even to southern Texas, too. That's where we're seeing the heaviest rain right now, where you see the yellows, the reds, the oranges. That's indicating where the heaviest rain is falling. So we have really warm air out ahead of this front. We have cold air. It's feeling like winter in some spots this morning. We're waking up to 20s and 30s. But ahead of this cold front, we're looking at temperatures in the 80s today. That's 11 degrees above normal Norfolk at 81 degrees. 84 in Charlotte, but behind it, 40s and 50s. Detroit, you are 14 degrees below normal for this time of year and only at 50 degrees. And unfortunately, this cold air slides to the east tomorrow, so a lot of spots in the 40s, low 40s at that. Buffalo, New York, you will be 18 degrees below normal, just 41. 43 in Pittsburgh, 59 in Annapolis, and 53 in Columbus. Then by Thursday, we're going to see that cold air in the northeast, so waking up to temperatures in the 30s from Boston to D.C. uh, on Thursday. Thursday morning, but we're going to warm up late in the week into the early next weekend, 62 by uh, Saturday in New York City, 68 in D.C. So it's going to be a short-lived cold spurt, but still not what we want this time of year. There's that chilly start for many, 39 million people impacted in the plains into the Midwest and Great Lakes. Where you see that hot pink color, that's a freeze warning. So uh, you want to cover any sensitive plants, a frost advisory is in the lighter pink. 
Des Moines and Springfield, Chicago, you are in that freeze warning. And we're going to see that extended as we go throughout the next couple of days. I do want to show you this. Yesterday, we had a little reprieve, a little break from fire danger. That has been elevated once again today. So we have a red flag warning in the central plains into parts of the southwest. And what that means is it's the highest level of alert to residents saying that any spark could start some wildfires. So you need to take caution. We have gusty winds. We have really low humidity. And the threat, the biggest threat, a critical risk is where you see the the red. So including Colby to Hayes, Dodge City, uh, down to parts of northern Texas. And then we do have an elevated risk as well, stretching from Nebraska all the way to Texas into New Mexico. And we could see winds gusting to 45 miles per hour. So once again, another dangerous situation and something we don't want to see. But we're going to keep it dry, uh, at least for an elevated over the next couple of days. Today's forecast, we're watching those spring showers uh, along that cold front stretching from Maine all the way to Houston. And we're looking at a really warm day in parts of the southeast. Temperatures in the 80s, 87 in Tampa, 83 in Miami. Again, a cold day in the upper Midwest. That's that cold Canadian air just funneling down, but really nice in the central and southern plains in terms of the temperatures besides that fire danger elevated. Wednesday, we look at a cold Midwest. We're looking at temperatures only in the 40s. Again, it's stretching to the northeast, so you kind of need those layers once again. Temperatures only in the 50s tomorrow in New York City. Back to you guys. All right. All right. Well, well, wear some sort of coat. Yeah. Not a big one. Some good yeah. news buried a little later yeah. in there. <laughs> yeah, but definitely I'm still hanging on the banister. I know. <laughs> you got to watch out for those fires already. All right, Michelle, thank you I so know. much. Yeah, sure. Coming up, China under lockdown as cases soar in the People's Republic. New restrictions are taking hold. But is this the latest outbreak? Is it a sign of things to come for the rest of the world? We're going to take a closer look after the break. Welcome back. We've got your international headlines now. Dozens of people are dead after clashes broke out between rival groups in Sudan's war-ravaged Darfur region. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudia Lavanga joins us with that and more world news. Claudia, good morning. Good morning, guys. Well, the number of people who were killed during those violent clashes between rival tribes uh, are up to at least 168 in Darfur in Sudan. Well, now, the at least according to an, an aid group that is operating in that area, the violence erupted after armed men attacked the village in retaliation of the killing of two of their fellow tribesmen. Now, this is only the latest episode in an escalation of violence in a country that is still trying to recover from a lengthy and bloody civil war. And let's move to Canada, where the decision by the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, to invoke the Emergency Act in February to deal with the protest by truck drivers will be the subject of an independent public inquiry. The Emergency Act was invoked for the first time in Canada's history and gave extraordinary powers to police to clear demonstrators who flooded the nation's capital with their trucks in protest against COVID-19 restrictions. And last but not least, well, people around the world drink coffee for different reasons, to stay awake, to socialize, and sometimes to help with their concentration. Or at least that's what they think at the Manuscript Writing Cafe, a coffee joint in Japan reserved for writers, editors, and manga artists. Upon entering, customers are required to write down their goals and they are not allowed to leave before they finish. Well, there is no doubt that quick espressos, guys, are not the most popular order in that cafe. <laughs> So they're not allowed to leave before they finish writing down their goals or before they finish their goals? Because that would be a long time in the cafe. Before they finish their work. Yeah. Be there a long time. Yeah. All right. All right. It's kind of a cool concept. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Claudio. <laughs> And now to the latest on the fight against COVID-19. China is going through its worst outbreak of COVID-19 since the beginning of the pandemic, as cases spike and lockdowns are brought back into cities like Beijing and Shanghai. Dr. Ali Raja joins us now. He's the executive vice chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital and an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Doctor, always great to have you with us. So let's just start with that. I mean, is this a sign of what's to come and why do these lockdowns seem to not really be working? It's a great question, Savannah. You know, first of all, I don't know that it's a sign of things to come for the U.S. and other really populous countries. You know, the fact is, when we think about Beijing, we're talking about 22 million people. Mm. Shanghai, 25 million people. That's three times the size of New York City. The setups in Beijing and in Shanghai that have led to Shanghai being locked down are not things that we can replicate around the country or around the world. Um, 
you know, the other thing is that the fact is that we don't quite know that the lockdown in Shanghai has been as effective. It was implemented a little late, about a month after they had already seen the rise. And so if you're going to implement something like that, it really needs to be done earlier. What I'm hopeful will work is what Beijing's actually doing right now. Um, over the next few days, between today, Tuesday, and Saturday, they're going to hope to test almost everyone in the city, 20 million people out of the 22, hoping to prevent the kind of lockdown that Shanghai was faced with recently. Yeah. Now, Doctor, this outbreak in China that we're discussing comes as a report from The New York Times highlights low vaccination rates among some of the world's most underdeveloped countries. As long as these populations are waiting for a vaccine, you know, we talk about this being this global disease, are new variants and global waves going to continue? I think so, Savannah, and it's really, it's really tragic. The fact is that even though we know this is a global disease, we tend to focus and put on blinders and focus on the local. And in the U.S., for example, we've got about between two-thirds and 70 percent of our population vaccinated. And I mean, many of the richest countries of the world are about there, between 60 and 70 percent or even more. The problem is that many of the poorest countries of the world are under 20 percent. The continent of Africa as a whole is less than 17 percent vaccinated. And what we tend to forget, because we're focusing on other crises, is that that's exactly what you noted, is that that's where the variants are going to develop, in places that don't have high vaccination rates, and they will spread around the world. So we really need to refocus both our energy and our funding on trying to get as much of the whole world vaccinated, not just our own local cities, states, and countries. And doctor, back here at home, though, we have seen cases in the U.S. rise in the past several weeks, but deaths from COVID infections have remained in a downtrend. I see that. I think that's good news. Is that right? Are these encouraging trends? It is. It's absolutely good news, Savannah. You know, I was working a shift yesterday in the emergency department, and I had a few patients come in after testing positive for COVID at home or who came in with vague system symptoms and, and tested positive with me. But most of them, actually all of them yesterday, were able to go home. And that's really good news mm. that the people who are testing positive are vaccinated and going home. You know, but what we're seeing is as mask mandates come down with public transportation and we don't have kids yet who are vaccinated under the age of five, we're not at all out of the woods. And so I, I love the fact that right now the current variants that we're seeing aren't hospitalizing people, mm -hmm. but we don't know what the next variants are going to do. And so it's still really important to try to get everybody vaccinated. Doctor, thank you so much. Good to see you. We appreciate your time this morning. Thanks, Savannah. A federal judge says he intends to temporarily block the Biden administration from lifting the coronavirus border restriction known as Title 42. The public health rule put in place by the Trump administration in March 2020 allows border authorities to turn away asylum seekers at the border because of the pandemic. Now, the Department of Homeland Security announced earlier this month that it would end the restrictions on May 23rd. This led to legal challenges from several of the border states. It's unclear whether the judge's order will actually stop the administration from lifting the rule altogether or just prevent it from winding it down before May 23rd. NBC News has reached out to the White House for comment, but we have not yet heard back. Coming up, newly released body camera footage capturing the distressing moments after an on-set tragedy. For the first time, Alec Baldwin's exchanges with investigators after that deadly, deadly rust shooting. Plus, Western wildfires ravaging forests across several states with no end in sight. Why authorities are saying this season is much harder to handle. Those stories and more are up next. President Biden is expected to issue his first round of pardons later today, while also commuting the sentences of 75 nonviolent drug offenders. The president will issue a total of 78 clemencies. That's more at this point in his term than the last five presidents. In a statement, President Biden said of the pardons, quote, the recipients are three people who have demonstrated their commitment to rehabilitation and are striving every day to give back and contribute to their communities. They include former Secret Service agent Abraham Bolden, who was convicted of attempting to sell a copy of a Secret Service file. Key witnesses later admitted to lying about Bolden at the request of prosecutors. The family of a 14-year-old boy who died last month on an Orlando amusement park ride has filed a wrongful death lawsuit. His father hopes the legal action creates reforms in the industry so no family has to endure his heartbreak. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock has the exclusive interview.
There's no mistaking the pain and anguish in Yarnell Sampson's voice. Uh, my son was Tyree Sampson, 14 years old. Uh, he's been taken away from me. Too soon. After experiencing the worst loss imaginable for any parent. When you kiss your child and tell them you love them, I don't have that choice or the chance no more. Now, a wrongful death lawsuit has been filed in Orlando Circuit Court after a horrifying night in late March. When, according to a state report, 14-year-old Tyree Sampson slipped through a gap between the harness and the seat on the freefall ride at Icon Park. A ride that drops nearly 400 feet at speeds up to 75 miles an hour. Sampson weighed about 380 pounds, according to his family, close to 100 pounds above the stated weight limit for the ride. The suit specifically claims the ride operator negligently adjusted restraint systems on the free fall ride, failed to train their employees, and failed to provide a safe amusement park ride. Last week's state report confirming manual adjustments were made to the shoulder sensor on the harness of Samson's seat, making it unsafe. We want Tyree's legacy to be that it will not happen again. The lawsuit targets Icon Park, the owner of the free fall, the Slingshot Group, and the Austrian manufacturer of the ride as well. Icon Park declined to comment on the lawsuit, and no representative with the manufacturer could be reached for comment. But a lawyer for the Slingshot Group told NBC News they continue to fully cooperate with the state during its investigation, adding, we reiterate that all protocols, procedures, and safety measures provided by the manufacturer of the ride were followed. Samson's family left with an unfillable void for the honor student and standout football player who showed such promise. The best thing to do is get the ball moving towards the right direction. We can make change together. Sam Brock and the state found the state report found the gap on the seat harness is normally three inches, but in Samson's seat, it was six to seven inches. The Samson family says this is a multi-million dollar lawsuit seeking damages for loss of life, pain and suffering and loss of future earnings. Now, newly released video is shedding light this morning on that deadly shooting on the set of the movie Rust. The Santa Fe Sheriff's Office has released the body camera footage connected to the fatal shooting that happened last October. The video shows officers making their way to the set, finding a chaotic scene and a distraught Alec Baldwin. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has the latest. After the more than six-month-long investigation, the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office has released a trove of new evidence. Alec Baldwin says he welcomes the release of new information. It comes as we're now seeing body camera footage for the first time. As paramedics raced onto the set of rust, it was too late to save cinematographer Helena Hutchins. By her side, director Joel Souza was also being treated for a gunshot wound. As they were being rushed to nearby hospitals, sheriff's deputies soon approached Alec Baldwin. Are you doing okay? No, I'm not, actually. For the first time, we are now hearing his exchanges with investigators. I was with the the gun, yeah. As crime scene technicians photographed Baldwin, they also retrieved video evidence. Deputies say this clip during rehearsal shows Baldwin drawing his revolver just moments before the fatal shot was fired. Sorry. You're okay. Sorry. Just relax. Just relax. I'm so scared. I'm sorry. You're all right. Just relax. <laughs> A flustered Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, the armorer in charge of all weapons on the set, seems to be surprised when she's told Baldwin was holding the gun. He was, had the gun, you know what I mean? Alan Baldwin did? Yeah. Oh, are you serious? So, cameras were also rolling during extensive sit-down interviews, where a despondent Gutierrez-Reed made a phone call before speaking to investigators. They are dummies. That's what I'm saying. And checked and they rattled. When rounds rattle, it's an indication the ammunition is a dummy round. But investigators say several live bullets, which don't rattle, were found on set. Most people just aren't aware of like the exacting nature of reloading. And during their interview with the film's ammunition provider, Seth Kenny provided deputies a series of old text messages where Hannah Gutierrez Reed had asked for live ammo during the filming of a previous movie, which is never allowed on set. She wanted to shoot live ammo out of 
the guns, the TV movie guns, and I said, no effing way, obviously. This morning, a clearer picture into a complex investigation and the still unanswered question, how did live rounds get onto a movie set? We've reached out to Hannah Gutierrez Reed and her attorneys. They say they are reviewing the tape as for criminal charges. We are told if those are potentially filed, it could still be weeks, if not months away. Back to you. Still so many questions, Miguel. Thank you. Out west, fire season is off to a furious start. Several states are battling fast-moving wildfires that have turned deadly. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson has more. The western wildfires turning deadly, raging through Nebraska and New Mexico with no end in sight. Nebraska authorities say a retired fire chief was killed on Sunday and at least 15 firefighters were injured while battling blazes across the state. The fire that killed 66-year-old John Thrumble has burned more than 40,000 acres and has no containment. The department says this year's fires have been harder to handle. The Nebraska National Guard deploying crews on the ground and in the air to help exhausted firefighters. The fire Fires made even more devastating by the strong winds, forcing thousands to evacuate in an unusually early start to the fire season. In New Mexico, 20 fires continue to burn out of control. The governor declaring a state of emergency, activating the National Guard. The announcement comes after two large fires merged in northern New Mexico on Saturday, forming the second largest blaze in the state, now only 12 percent contained. Particularly here in New Mexico, our fire seasons have been starting earlier and they've been going longer. Wildfires now becoming a year-round threat in the West. In Arizona, some residents were allowed to return after evacuating due to a fire near Flagstaff that destroyed at least 30 homes. But in New Mexico, winds and temperatures remain strong enough to keep evacuation orders in place. Our thanks to Steve Patterson for that report. And coming up, if you've got travel plans, get ready for some potential headaches. There's a massive shortage of pilots as we, as we head into summer. We'll dig into why the major carriers are struggling to fill their cockpits. Plus, it's no secret heading back to the office will cost you more than working from home. So how can you save some cash while commuting? We've got you covered next. Welcome back. Wall Street is bracing for another white knuckle day with some blockbuster earnings reports from big tech and a round of economic data that could swing the markets even more. CNBC Silvana Hanau is here with all your financial headlines. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Hey, guys, good morning. Yeah, so Wall Street could be in line for a pullback today after stocks reverse losses late yesterday to close higher. Investors are getting set for a week of earnings from the biggest of the big tech stocks. Today, we'll hear from Microsoft and Google Parent Alphabet. We're also awaiting fresh economic data on home prices, new home sales, and consumer confidence. Fidelity plans to let investors put Bitcoin into their 401ks. It's the first major provider of retirement plans to do so. Later this year, the more than 20,000 companies that use Fidelity to administer their plans will have the option to add Bitcoin to the menu. Under the plan, savers could allocate as much as 20% of their nest egg to Bitcoin. Other digital assets could be added in the future. Ford officially begins production of the F-150 Lightning electric pickup today at its factory in Dearborn, Michigan. The automaker will have executives, employees, union leaders and customers on hand to get the assembly line rolling. Ford is hoping to produce 150,000 Lightnings per year. It already has about 200,000 reservations. The Lightning starts at just under 40,000 with the standard battery. That's good for 230 miles. A mid-range battery will set you back more than 54000 and the long-range F-150 starts at $75,000, guys. Wow. Quite a battery. All right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Quite a range there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Silvana, thank you. You got it. Millions of people are once again taking to the skies if you don't want a battery in a truck to get you anywhere. <laughs> but there's a new warning this morning if you're planning on traveling during the busy summer season. Yeah, there's been a lot of them, actually. Yeah. But now we've got a new one. Now all the airlines are feeling hopeful, saying the summer could be their most profitable yet. Passengers could be faced with a new issue in the skies, a major pilot shortage. NBC News senior national correspondent Carrie Sanders joins us from Fort Lauderdale International Airport from a cockpit. Of course, we would expect nothing less from you. Hi, Carrie. Good morning. <laughs> 
Well, good morning. This is the cockpit of a 767. And the problem, of course, is, as you said, a pilot shortage, finding enough people to sit into these seats who want to do this as a profession. To sort of put a fine point on the problem, consider what JetBlue announced this morning, that they are not going to grow in the next year as an airline. Instead, they are going to sacrifice profit for reliability. This morning, the national commercial pilot shortage wreaking havoc on passengers. Got on a plane, they canceled the flight, and I've been on endless lines. With fewer COVID tests these days, Americans are traveling again. But virtually every airline is scrambling to fill their cockpits. The lack of pilots leading to delays, flight cancellations, and even grounded fleets. Several airlines hiring buses to replace planes on shorter routes. American recently announced they've started using buses to ferry passengers from smaller airports in the Northeast to their hub in Philadelphia, where more pilots are available. There are an estimated 14,500 openings for commercial pilots over the next eight years. The problem? Not enough new pilots moving from smaller regional airlines to the major carriers and too few pilots exiting the military to work in the private sector. Pilot training can cost more than $100,000. Jonathan Manivel runs the Miami Flight Academy. It's a, an addition of different things. Pilot retiring, the pandemic. So now just to train the new pilots is going to take a long time. Some airlines are now training future pilots themselves. United hoping to train up to 5,000 pilots over the next eight years at its own aviation academy. Yeah, this is, this is a nice stable descent. This is good. Yeah. Instructor Shelly Thomas is planning to become a commercial pilot herself. As soon as I realized that there was a pilot shortage and, and a lot of my other mentors at United kind of brought it up. JetBlue has a similar program, no flying experience required. Finally, I met the right people to set me in the right direction, and I jumped. Veteran pilots say one short-term solution, let those forced to retire at age 65, as required by the FAA, back into the cockpit. Rich Seiler was a Delta pilot for 35 years. We are forced out, and it's no other industry in the world that I know of that it happens like that. So if you've ever been on a plane that was delayed and then you heard the announcement that the pilots timed out and there are no reserve pilots, then you understand what this shortage is all about. Of course, I imagine Savannah, Joe, you guys are a little more used to traveling with a plane like this. <laughs> yeah. This is VIP Completions Interior, which is, well, pretty amazing if you're delayed, but I think the rest of us know what it's really like, guys. Yeah, a, not, not a relatable experience, probably, yeah. for the yeah, majority you know of travelers. Friends for an onboard lunch at your dining table, Carrie. Right, Carrie Sanders, thank you, appreciate <laughs> Headroom it. Headroom in the back, believe it or not. <laughs> oh, God. Thanks, Carrie. All right, now, as we've all noticed, it seems like the cost of just about everything is going up, so it makes sense that as you return to in-person work, nearly every aspect of that is going to cost you more, too. But as NBC News senior consumer and Investigative correspondent Vicki Wynn shows us there are a few simple ways you can avoid going broke just getting to work. Eugenia Kemma recently returned to the office. It's a little expensive, you know, having to leave the house, go out. He documented his commute from Belvedere, New Jersey to New York City, where he's an engineer. His day starts with an early morning 30-minute drive to a bus station. I'm lucky in that I have a nice, small, efficient Korean car. But even that's cost double. It used to cost me only $20 to fill her up. Now it costs me a good old $40. Next, a ride into the city. Before the pandemic, it cost him $66 round trip. Now, 90 bucks. Once he arrives, it's time for coffee. That will be for a wait. All right, thank you. He says his caffeine boost now costs about $1.50 more. His lunchtime sandwich at a fast food spot also spiking in price. Could I have a footlong Subway club on wheat? My Subway used to cost $7.50, now it costs $11.50. He estimates he spends $33 more per day just to go to work in person. And pocketbooks are being pinched nationwide. In the past year, the average sandwich price climbed 14%, tacos 12%, salads 11%. And if you love a good wrap, that now costs 18% more. 
Lynette Calfani Fox is a financial educator and CEO of themoneycoach.net. She says the tried and true method of brown bagging it is still the best way to save, but adds we should all think outside the lunchbox. Maybe you use taco trucks as opposed to a sit down menu at a higher end restaurant. Just how much more expensive is it for workers returning to the office? Costs are up on average anywhere from 10 to 40 percent. One of the most obvious increases, fuel. The national average gallon of regular 412. That's a 44 percent increase from last year. Lynette says it might sound extreme, but could you cut a car? My family, we just ditched one of our cars. We just sold it. And I'm telling you, I am jumping for joy. Between insurance, gas, and maintenance, the savings can be enormous. The typical American family can save $10,000 a year. Okay, I could save $10,000 a year if I get rid of one of our cars, but how do we get around? Can you carpool with someone else? Can you take public transportation? Can you bike? Are you within walking distance of your place of business? Um, sometimes ride sharing even may be cheaper. You can't cut the kids, but you can save on child care and you'll need to. It now costs an average of more than $10,000 a year per child. To save, look at your circle of friends, neighbors, and relatives. Can you take turns watching each other's children? What about when it comes to the things we have to wear to work? What are ways right. to save there? The very first thing you should do is shop your own closet and then see if you can jazz it up in some ways. Maybe you can put a pair of um, earrings or a nice necklace on with it. Start with what you have first so that going back to work in person works for your wallet. Our thanks to Vicki Wynn for that report and to show you how much you can save by bringing your lunch, consider this. The average lunch at a restaurant is about $12 compared to about $6 if you bring it from home, that's a savings of over $1,200 per year. And I was not the one who did that math. No, also a $12 lunch in New York doesn't exist. Yeah, I know. But, like it's but we're in New like York. We get it. Five ish. Or so, no kidding. All right. right? Coming up, <laughs> yes. Breaking barriers in the final frontier. Yeah, we'll introduce you to the first black woman to have a long duration stay hundreds of miles above planet Earth at the International Space Station. That's next. Welcome back. A couple who live next to a golf course have won a nearly $5 million settlement after their property was hit by more than 600 balls in four years. The Massachusetts couple suffered multiple broken windows caused by those golf balls blasted by players seeking a shortcut to the 15th hole. Their lawyer told NBC News they thought they were buying a golf course view property, and what they ended up buying was a golf course in play property. The Indian Pond Country Club has moved the start of the offending hole, but plans to appeal the court's decision. I don't know, I feel like it kind of comes with the territory on a golf course, but that sounds scary to be yeah, near the windows Yeah, that seems like a little inside. much. You know what yeah. they say about real estate. Location, location, location. So, 15th hole, not a good one. All right, well, hopefully they find a new place. Yes. All right, thank you, Savannah. <laughs> now, Jessica Watkins is going to make history tomorrow as the first black woman to complete an extended mission to the International Space Station. She sat down with NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt to talk about the barriers she's breaking. This week's planned SpaceX launch to the International Space Station will carry a real rock star on board, a geologist whose long endurance space mission will break some inspiring new ground. Jessica Watkins has always been intrigued about the makeup of different planets. The geologist considers herself a rock detective. Watkins, who was a NASA intern on two Mars lander missions, likens rock research to putting together pieces of a puzzle. But she has always had bigger aspirations. Did you ever think you'd be sitting here wearing that uniform with a mission on your schedule? I certainly always really enjoyed all of my internships and the exposure that I got with NASA and, and uh, dreamed of just being a part of the NASA team. To be able to do so in, in this role in this way is just super exciting. Wadi, as her crew members call her, blasts off Wednesday for a six-month stay on the International Space Station, becoming the first black woman to have a long-duration stay aboard the orbiting laboratory. Do you see that as a barrier-breaking moment or just part of a natural progression? 
I think it's it's almost both. The reason that we are able to arrive at this time is because of the legacy of those who have come before to allow for this moment. And then also recognizing that this is a step in, in the direction of a very f exciting future. Is it also a teachable moment, an opportunity for you to teach to not only people of color, but women, the importance of STEM and, and all the things that you had to put in to get where you are today? Growing up and throughout my career, um, it's been really important for me to see people who look like me or have uh, my background or similar experiences in the roles that um, I aspire to and contributing in ways that I aspire to contribute. To the extent that I'm able to do that for others, I'm grateful for the opportunity to return the favor. Watkins could be named to a future mission that would put an American back on the lunar surface for the first time since 1972 for myself as an individual, but also um, as a team to, to think about the challenges and um, come up with the technologies and uh, push the bounds of the science that we can learn on the moon is just super exciting. Our thanks to Lester and our mm -hmm. best wishes to Watkins Absolutely. on that. We love a space story. Exactly. It was that one. Very, Very cool. inspiring. That does it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.